989. Welcome to 989 on Health, where you don't need years of university to understand the latest news about health and related subjects. We've created a list of helpful links on today's topic at our website, level989.com, and you can also find those links in the podcast playing app you're using right now. This informal discussion shares our personal views. Don't rely on this podcast as an alternative to medical advice from a professional healthcare provider. For the full disclaimer, please see our website. I'm Mike Davalos, just an average Joe, and the fine gentleman here with me is anything but average. It's Brandon Weintraub, a primary care physician. We're recording at an unusual time today. Good afternoon, Mr. Brandon. And good afternoon to you, Mike. Our topic for today is something called clean eating. Brandon, when you chose this as a topic, you were pretty vague on the details, as I recall. You said, I keep hearing about clean eating, but I don't know what it is. I'm guessing that after a couple of weeks with which to research it, you're now an expert. I suppose clean eating isn't simply about washing the dirt off your broccoli before you eat it. How about a quick introduction to what clean eating is? I think I can do that. I just hope that the listening community doesn't think less of me for not knowing what this particular diet fad was until, well, now. I don't know if it's just coincidence, but for some reason I've started to see quite a few more references to the concept of eating clean from the perspective of both proponents and opponents. But before I start monologuing, let me just answer your question. Clean eating, at its heart, seems to be a collection of varying dieting rules that sound like a mixture of common sense and avoidance of the latest health boogeymen. Followers are encouraged to eat fresh produce, avoid heavily processed foods, reduce intake of added sugars, and, in general, pay attention and be aware of what they're putting in their body. More recently, the list of rules has been updated to include avoidance of gluten. The information I found about clean eating in my own research was very scattered. It's not a new idea. The book Eating Clean for Dummies came out in 2011. Just one example of the dozens of books, cookbooks, life coaching guides, and hundreds of fitness blog posts on and on, all either praising the virtues of clean eating as good news straight from the angels, or condemning it as a food disorder or other evil that will lead you down the dark road to malnutrition and an early death. But the usual sources I tend to hit up for measured dose of Vulcan philosophy, uh, the FDA, the National Institutes of Health, the World Health Organization, all of these credible sites were suspiciously quiet about clean eating, which worries me more than I would have expected. Why is popular media so happy to discuss clean eating ad nauseum, while the more sciencey sites seem to have so little to say? It's funny you mention that. I suspect that at least a portion of my own ignorance about clean eating is because I haven't seen any specific scientific articles about it. All I have are theories at this point about why this might be the case, but I guess I can lay those on you. First of all, the eating clean trend seems to be somewhat variable, even among the most popular sources that discuss the topic. Is gluten okay? Not okay? What constitutes an unhealthy additive? Is non-organic produce okay? Or is it critical to stick with only organic produce? Since some of the rules are so transient, it makes sense that modern researchers haven't managed to figure out what, and how, to best test the overall diet of eating clean. So what about testing just the most common concepts behind clean eating? To a certain degree, that actually has been done. But of course, there are problems there too. Let's use one of the most actively argued aspects of clean eating, focusing on organic produce instead of traditionally farmed produce. The NCBI is flooded with research studies, meta-studies, and articles discussing the benefits, or lack thereof, to organic produce. Even before the articles begin, a major problem occurs. Many of these studies ask the question, is organic produce healthier than non-organic produce? In previous episodes, we've discussed the difficulties of asking if something is healthier, and here we are again. What is healthier? Is nutrient content the only important aspect? Are we talking about lower levels of pesticides? Healthier for whom? What age groups? What gender? Heck, How can you tell someone is healthier? Do they live longer? Do they have a lower heart rate? Maybe their blood sugar is better regulated. Western science defines itself by making sure that every variable is described in detail. Nonetheless, I can't help but feel that when it comes to disproving differing viewpoints, sometimes standards get a little lax. Well, thanks for the mini rant, but you've got my interest now. So how about filling me in on the results of these studies? I need to know if I should start shelling out the extra 39 cents a pound for my bananas. 
I know this is going to surprise you, so buckle your seatbelt. Even ignoring the troubles with defining what healthier means, the studies conflict. Most of the studies do show that whether the produce is organic or not doesn't change the nutritional content. It's more about the conditions of the growing season, like soil quality and weather. But there are a few studies that claim organic produce does have higher concentrations of things like vitamin C, iron, and magnesium. I feel confident you'll find the same thing with almost any topic you choose regarding something as broad as the rules of clean eating are. I guess we're going to have to break it all down for ourselves then. Let's start out with the good news. In essence, my research demonstrated the same results as yours. Most of the clean eating stuff seems like common sense and good logic. Rule one seems to be don't eat processed foods. And that rules out fully 99% of everything you'll find at a modern grocery store, leaving only uh, whole fruits, vegetables, and meat. Basically, you're buying ingredients. You're not buying processed meals. Is that right? Indeed it is. As far as I can tell, the true end goal of eating clean seems to be making people aware of what they're eating and how much. By purchasing whole, fresh produce and meats and cooking it at home, a person can get all of the benefits of eating well without the constant concern about what else may have been involved in a meal's preparation. That all sounds pretty healthy. I doubt any doctor would have a problem hearing that their patient has stopped eating processed food. No more preservatives, added sugar, excess salt, right? Is there a problem with cutting processed foods that I'm missing? Well, like I said earlier, processing food by itself isn't really the problem. Uh, Processed food, if you just look at the definition, is just raw ingredients that have been changed by physical or chemical means into food in a different form. Chopping up an onion and frying it on a pan makes it a processed food. So unless you're planning on just chomping down on every food you eat with no cooking or slicing, you're going to eat processed foods. Actually, even chewing on a food technically processes it. Okay, okay, we get it. It's impossible to avoid processing foods. When I think of processed foods, I think of prepared and ready edibles, ready for me to eat them with little or no work on my part. Cans of pre-cooked meaty chili, boxes of tasty single-serve cakes wrapped in plastic. I'm betting that's what's generally meant when talking about processed foods. So what about that? Are there unforeseen consequences of cutting those out of my diet? One significant issue that I think most Americans will relate to, time. I'll use myself as an example because, as our resident health expert, I ought to set a good example, right? I work on average six days a week. I ought to wake up early. It would need to be around 4.30 a.m. for me to get moving on time. And head to the gym. After my two-hour workout and cardio session, I should head home, shower, make myself breakfast, just in time to do some quick early morning chores or some shopping, and head to work. After eight to ten hours with my nose to the grindstone, I ought to come home and make myself dinner. Somewhere in there ought to be a lunch I also made from scratch. Clean up after dinner, research and decompression time, working on the podcast, eh? and trying to stay in touch with the professional and social connections I've made. Sound familiar? I bet it does. No, not really. That just sounds like one of my days off. I always knew you worked way too hard. Well, that still makes my point. With so much that needs to get done, it can seem incredibly difficult to find time to breathe, let alone cook fresh, from-scratch meals that are both delicious and nutritious. How easy to just have a few frozen veggies on hand or to grab a container of chicken salad from your local grocery store? Turning all the fresh ingredients into food does sound as if it will be more time-consuming. It's also more expensive, especially when you take into account all the spoilage that's going to occur with all this fresh stuff. You know, I've had a box of pasta in my pantry for two years now. If I boil it up and smother it with cheese, it will still be yummy. But if I buy fresh, whole peaches, they're probably hard and underripe. And even if I keep a close eye on them for days, those peaches will wait. Those little bastards will wait until I'm asleep to go from hard as a rock to mushy goo. Brandon, why are peaches such a vindictive fruit? And what about the very likely possibility that I would go broke trying to buy all these fresh, whole foods? Is clean eating a dietary approach that only can work for rich people? I've never really thought about peaches as malicious. Have you, have you tried storing them in a paper bag? Or apologizing to the rosaceae plant family in general? You know what you did. More importantly, the idea that healthy eating is expensive eating is a pervasive one. If you've set foot in a store like Whole Foods Market, you've almost certainly experienced sticker shock at the cost of some of their offerings. And based on your peaches story, I know you've experienced produce going bad before you have a chance to eat it. 
between increased cost and increased loss of purchased product, the expenses can certainly rack up. However, there was a significant study published in 2013 in British medical journal Open that concluded that the additional daily cost of eating healthy would indeed cost more, but only $1.50 more per day. Just $1.50? Hmm, that's what, like $550 more per year? That's exactly the conclusion the study arrived at. There are a ton of details worth reading, and I'll be sure to include a link to the study in today's show notes. But the findings are pretty interesting. Of course, they don't include the cost and time and effort to a person that has to cook these foods after they purchase them, but it demonstrates that someone who is dedicated to eating more fresh foods can succeed with very little additional expenditure. Simply saying avoid processed foods sounds pretty straightforward, but when you realize this covers breads, muffins, cake, cookies, scones, biscotti, granola bars, turnovers, pastries, donuts, chips, and crackers, I wonder what it is you medical types are expecting me to use as fuel to get through the day. I mean, quick bursts of cheap, dirty energy do the same thing for the human body they do for a nation's economy. Help them lurch forward in an ultimately unsustainable frenzy, a progression that leaves you depleted at the worst possible time in an environment poisoned in the process. (gasps) I'm not sure what my question was. I think I kind of, um, ran out of gas. Leave it to you to mention snacking. Well, according to many of those clean eating resources out there, One fundamental rule is to eat several smaller meals a day, five or six in all. That means that your snacking concerns are actually covered. Eh? Good news. As for what you might want to consider as healthy options, well, there's a ton of unprocessed options out there. How about some unsalted mixed nuts or vegetables and hummus? Some fresh fruit? Oatmeal? Maybe leftovers from breakfast or dinner the previous night, depending on what version of the clean eating dietary rules you follow. Even something like a whole wheat toast with a bit of fresh ground almond butter could be a great option. Doing the research on this topic was a bit confusing and contradictory. Some clean eating pages said to avoid dairy, coffee, and tea, while others made no mention of these restrictions at all. Obviously, with any approach to a change in diet, even if it shares the same overall umbrella name, there can be many variations. But is there one definitive official clean eating instruction list? Like Back in the day with the Atkins diet, it all started out with Dr. Atkins and his plan. You could read his official book, you could read the official website, but I don't think clean eating all started with Dr. Clean. I won't say that I'm 100% sure on this one. As far as I can tell, there isn't any primary source, any Professor Eat Clean that began the new diet craze. Self, a magazine that focuses on women's health, wellness, and style, published an article in January of 2017 that seems to confirm my theory. Quote, There is no one set definition for clean eating. It's most commonly used to refer to a diet of whole and minimally processed foods. End quote. One of the more popular approaches to clean eating seems to be something called Whole30, which describes a plan where you completely change your diet for 30 days. And remember, a diet is not something you go on. Your diet is what you eat. The list of no-nos described by the Whole30 plan are no sugar of any kind, no alcohol, no grains, no legumes. As mentioned in our episode number 15 about the paleo diet, legumes are things like beans, peas, and peanuts. Also no dairy, no MSG. That's monosodium glutamate, a salt and amino acid. And at the top of the list is the instruction not to consume baked goods or junk food which you would have thought had already been covered in the no sugar and no grains bullet points, but maybe some folks don't know what's in a candy bar. Maybe I'm missing something, but this sounds an awful lot like the paleo diet. Am I wrong? For the most part, you're absolutely right. Both the Whole30 and the paleo diet ban legumes, grains, dairy, and processed foods. There are two significant differences. The first is that paleo diet actually allows natural sugars, like honey while the Whole30 diet plan insists you cut out as much sugar as possible, natural or processed. The second is that the Whole30 is designed as a 30-day strict diet, while paleo is actually intended as a longer-term change to your eating habits, which many followers will adjust as needed to fit their requirements. After the list of no-nos are a list of exceptions for Whole30, which include clarified butter, fruit juice, some legumes, It seems green beans are allowed for some reason. Vinegars, which do not contain gluten, are allowed. Vinegar has gluten in it. And they take a moment to say that salt is okay, even though it contains sugar. 
Okay, okay, wait. Does our table salt have added sugar? You know what? It does. I just checked my big can of Morton salt, and it does in fact have sugar in the form of dextrose. Now, if that's so, why did this not come up in our diabetes coverage way back in episode 6? Also, how do you feel about these exceptions? What's the point of saying no dairy, and then immediately saying, well, butter's okay? You know, the first time I learned that commercially available salt contained sugar, I was surprised, to say the least. It isn't all commercially available salt, but if you're buying iodized salt, I can almost promise you that your salt has sugar in it. Sugar in your salt is added to help keep the potassium iodide, like I said, in iodized salt, from oxidizing and being lost. As for why it didn't make it into our diabetes coverage, well, to be honest, there's two reasons. The first is that it completely slipped my mind. I've been using rock salts, Himalayan salt, and Celtic salt for so long, it didn't even occur to me to mention it. The second reason is that the amount of sugar added to your salt is very small or as Morton Salt Incorporated puts it, dietetically insignificant. It amounts to about 0.04% sugar per container, or about 40 milligrams in each 100 grams of salt. So you're saying the salt would kill you before the sugar would? In terms of affecting your blood sugar for diabetics, the amount of sugar is so small that it's unlikely to have any significant effect. All right, I suppose. But how about my other question? Trying to dodge it, huh? Are you going to give us diet plan backsliders a stern talking to? On the contrary, our regular listeners will know by now that the idea behind dieting is one that doesn't sit well with me. The idea that suddenly changing your eating habits all at once, according to a strict and unbending set of rules, will help you be healthier, is not a good one. Even the word diet, rather than just meaning what you eat, is now laced with other connotations, bringing to mind someone getting so desperate to lose a few pounds that they're willing to give up the habits of decades and subsist on the latest fad of algae and seaweed smoothies. Eating shouldn't be a constant battle with yourself, and if you make too many changes or try to stick too firmly to a set of dietary restrictions which just aren't right for you as an individual, health and waistline are likely to suffer. But don't take my word for it. There's a strong connection between binge eating behaviors and dieting. The link first garnered national attention in the U.S. in 1985 when it was demonstrated under laboratory conditions. Since then, according to Psychology Today, the likelihood of binge behavior in the presence of strict diet and calorie reduction has become so common, many eating disorder experts just consider the link a given. Okay, that was a really, really long answer. So, you're okay with people adjusting the rules of their diets? I would go as far as to say that I demand that people do so. Every person is different. I know I harp on that a lot, but it's just so relevant. Yes, there are generalizations that might help, but sticking strictly and unbendingly to a diet plan can be harmful. Just because it worked for Glenda at the florist doesn't mean it will work as well, or as safely, for you. Just for clarity, and there's no judgment here when I say, Whole30 seems to be a business that's catering to health-conscious folks to sell them recipes, meal plans, and dietary advice. You could say the same of Weight Watchers or many other companies. There's nothing wrong with making money, and they're probably really helping people explore healthier options. Though, just to make it clear, Whole30 is not a diet plan engineered by some doctors at the Mayo Clinic. But I don't see any reason why the advice they're giving can't work. Cutting back on carbohydrates alone would make a big impact on someone's health. I don't expect you to have encyclopedic knowledge of the whole Whole30 plan after researching their site briefly, but based on the list of no-nos and exceptions, What do you think? Well, I hadn't actually heard of the Whole30 until this podcast. And it's true that the diet definitely wasn't created by Mayo Clinic physicians. One founder was an author and a sports nutritionist, and the other was a licensed physical therapist and also a sports nutritionist. Off the cuff, I'd say that the Whole30 is coming from a good place. In general, I think almost anyone could benefit from increasing their whole food intake, eating more fresh fruits and vegetables, avoiding excessive carbohydrates, and reducing sugars. However, the Whole30 still feels like a stereotypical modern diet fad to me. And even though the end goal is supposed to be to slowly reintroduce the foods you've avoided for the 30 days, I'd be willing to put good money that A. Any loss of weight seen over the month would be quick to return, and B. 
that a majority of people would simply go right back to eating anything and everything they wanted. After all, the diet's over now, right? Like I said, many of the changes suggested by the Whole30 diet plan would likely be a good thing for the average American. But a slow, intentional change, well understood and carefully considered, would, in my opinion, be much more likely to improve a person's health over the long term. Just to use myself as a personal example for a moment, I rarely eat out and tend to eat a lot of the same food. A lot of eggs, breast meat, chicken, and bananas. I supplement this with some breakfast cereal and granola bars. So it seems that if I could just replace the cereal and the granola bars with veggies, I'm already eating clean. What occurs to me when I consider that is a lot of the grain-based foods offer fiber and have been enriched with vitamins and minerals. So if I replaced the cereal and granola bars with something like homemade cucumber, carrot, and cabbage salad, something I could actually see myself eating, am I good to go? Or is my body going to miss the vitamins and minerals in enriched food? What about the vitamin D and calcium I'll be missing if I'm not eating cereal with milk? I do take a daily multivitamin, by the way. That's a great question, and one that's difficult for me to answer. The idea is that, because you're eating more vegetables, fruits, and good quality meats, you'd be getting all the fiber, fats, vitamins, minerals, and amino acids you're supposed to be getting. Will that be the case? I don't want to say yes for certain, because there are too many variables. In general, it's been proven that soil quality in the U.S. has declined over the last few years. The nutrient concentration present in commercial farming soils has decreased. So, in some cases, eating produce that would have been nutrient-rich enough without supplementation in the past may not be adequate in the present day. You know, sometimes I feel like you live for the opportunity to tell me how horrible things are now. I can't even feel as good about eating fresh fruits and veggies anymore. Sounds to me like you're saying I'll still need my multivitamin, even if I eat exactly the way a modern nutritionist might say I should. That actually is kind of what I'm saying. Recently, I've been seeing research studies that indicate vitamin and mineral supplementation can lead to a host of health problems all on their own. The theory is that by making sure not to supplement without medical advice from a professional practitioner, you'll be safe from the negative effects. In practice, who knows? I have a follow-up question about my own diet. I mentioned the chicken I eat. It actually comes in a bag. It's frozen and pre-cut. I eat the pulled variety. It's kind of shredded and it's pre-cooked. I'm guessing that all of that qualifies my chicken as processed food. So would I be better off cooking my own? And if so, why? That pulled chicken definitely counts as processed. The theory then is that cooking your own chicken would have several benefits. First and foremost, any of the preservatives that are legally required to be added to previously cooked food would be absent. Second, you would be able to ensure that you get the freshest and best quality meat. And finally, you would know exactly what and how much additional flavorings, spices, and fats were used in your meal. That way, you can pick and choose your calorie counts, your fat types, you name it. More control, less chemical additives. One of the things people often forget when they're describing their diet and their intake are beverages. Soft drinks or deluxe coffees, these can have a lot of sugar. And I know that until recently, coffee I make at home and work had a lot of sugar in it. But I've recently taken steps to eliminate all sugar from my coffee. Might not be a big deal for some, but I drink a lot of coffee. So sweet drinks are definitely a consideration if you're thinking about eating clean. Coffee tastes pretty terrible without sugar. Let me tell you, it will be an adjustment. Well, you're assuming that if you decide to start eating clean, that you'll be following one of the diet plans that allows you to drink coffee. Some of them definitely don't. The sugary sweet coffees that people have come to know and love are unfortunate, to say the least. The number of calories, the amount of sugar, and even the smallest size icy coffee beverage can be outrageous. 190 calories for an 8-ounce beverage? No thanks. Regular black coffee, which, by the way, has been shown to have potential health benefits, although what hasn't, right? It has an estimated calorie count of 3 calories per 8-ounce cup. It may be a bit of an adjustment to get used to the flavor of coffee. Real, actual coffee. Not just the added sugars and flavorings. But I would encourage you to try. You might even start being able to taste the more subtle flavors of the different varieties and roasting methods involved in making the coffee bean. 
One thing that struck me while I was researching clean eating was some folks calling it an eating disorder, specifically orthorexia, which is characterized by an excessive preoccupation with eating healthy food. And I'm like, yeah, that's what a healthy lifestyle is. If a person decides to truly pursue a healthy life, many of your daily choices are going to be ruled by the guidelines you've set yourself. Not to sit on your butt for 18 hours a day and not to eat junk. And that would take intense effort and focus. Yet you're going to be preoccupied with that. Obviously, anything can be an unhealthy obsession. Uh, Take video games. You might play five minutes of Angry Birds while you're in line at the post office, or you could play World of Warcraft every waking moment until you've lost your job and your spouse because of it. That's very true. It can be difficult to believe that something like, say, exercise can somehow become unhealthy. After all, I hate exercise, right? And the doctors keep saying exercise is important. So if 30 minutes is good, then 60 should be better, right? So what is the key to figuring out when something that should be healthy has begun to approach the line where it might start to be more harmful than helpful? If someone finds that their lives are being affected in a negative way, if their family life is suffering, or maybe they're suddenly experiencing new health concerns that may seem unrelated, for example. It's a tricky problem, and one that has to be determined by each and every individual. If your eating habits have become central to everything you do, to the point where you're separating yourself from your loved ones, or eating so little that your health is suffering due to malnutrition, it's time to consider how helpful the level of attentiveness to your daily diet actually is. Eating crap food that's going to kill you by age 50 should be considered an eating disorder, but it doesn't seem to be. In fact, the Wikipedia article about eating disorders, it specifically spells out that obesity is not an eating disorder. I mean, I realize it's Wikipedia, but how can that be correct? I guess you could say that obesity might be the result of one or more eating disorders, but might have other causes. I'm thinking in most cases, there's no genetic syndrome or disease that makes me personally overweight. I really enjoy snacking and eating carbs, and I enjoy the energy boost they give me. I might even be addicted to that vicious cycle. But that's not an eating disorder, and eating healthy is an eating disorder? That's bull poop, Brandon. Bull poop! Now, now. Eating healthy isn't an eating disorder. The obsessive tendencies related to eating healthy can result in an eating disorder. Here's my opinion, and you'll have to take it for whatever it's worth. The term obese refers to an individual's body mass being a certain amount over what has been determined to be the optimal average number to see the best overall health benefits. It is just as possible for a person to be extremely underweight, although I don't know what the official term would be to describe that situation. If a person has an eating disorder, say anorexia, they often end up severely underweight. But their lack of weight isn't the disorder. It's the mental and physical symptoms that cause them to eat so little, or exercise so much that is labeled as the disorder. It isn't any different with obesity. Carrying a lot of extra body weight isn't the cause, it's the effect. So, it would be better to look at obesity not as an eating disorder, but to find the underlying symptoms that all add up to cause a person to become or be obese. While we were discussing the possibility of doing clean eating as a topic, even though you were the one who suggested it, you were uncertain. You're concerned that too many of our episodes are about diet. In fact, as I look at the list of our episodes, it looks like only a third of them are about diet. You know, really, a lot of health is diet, so I think that's only natural and should be expected. It's true. Getting, being, and staying healthy does not exactly make for the trendiest or most entertaining of podcasts. I don't want our topics to get old for our listeners, but I can't fault your logic. Eating and exercise are two of the most critical aspects to human health, and if you eat right, you're going to be on the right path to reaching your health and wellness goals. So we've discussed some pros and cons, but in the end, can you recommend clean eating? I know you're not a dietitian, and you'd never try to exceed your scoop of practice, but that said? That said, I like the fundamental ideas behind clean eating. Eating fresh produce, high-quality meats, reducing sugars, being aware of the content of your food, even eating the best types of fats. These are all key elements to clean eating and concepts we've discussed numerous times already. My concern about clean eating lies in the variety a person might try to adhere to. 
gluten-free is good for some people, but I don't know that it's the right way to go as a blanket rule. More importantly, certain proponents of clean eating focus more on the, excuse the pun, flavor of the month. Health food crazes come and go, and clean eating often jumps on the bandwagon for each new evil food or villainous additive, even before there's any useful data or viable proof. If nothing else, I'd love to see everyone become as aware of what they eat as clean eating would have them be. Read your labels. Know where your food comes from and how it's made. Once you know what you're putting in your body, you'll be much less likely to eat things that just aren't right for you. Is there anything else you want to mention before we wrap it up? Actually, this is one of those rare instances where I don't have a whole lot more to say. Eating clean has a lot to be said for it, or at least for the ideas that are its center. Being aware of what's going in your body, how it makes you feel, and avoiding those things that have a negative impact on your health are all great concepts to integrate into your life. Just be cautious. Even though your favorite talk show host may have had a doctor on recently that had a persuasive argument about a new and terrifying possible food villain, doesn't mean everyone ought to quickly jump onto this new bandwagon. Try to moderate what you think of as healthy or unhealthy using a comfortable balance of personal experience, modern research, and a very reasonable dose of medical advice from your personal practitioners. Well said there, sir. As always, that's all the time we have for today. These short episodes are a brief overview of very complex topics. Everything we say is for entertainment and educational purposes only. Licensed healthcare professionals should advise you and be aware of changes that you're planning to make to any aspect of your healthcare. Every person's needs are different. The links to references we've made about news articles, medical studies, and other materials can be found at level989.com along with our contact information in the complete Don't Take Medical Advice from Podcasts disclaimer. Don't forget to take a moment to rate or review us on iTunes or give us a mention on social media. We can inform everyone if they don't know we exist. Thanks for listening, and now go help yourself.